Hello everyone, uh, we at ASEI hope you all are doing very well and uh, we hope that you've fastened your seatbelt because you're about to be taken on a solo ride uh, by Dr. Ravi, <coughs> Ravi Mansal and uh, he's going to explain to you his incredible journey so be with him but before you embark on this journey let me cover a few housekeeping tips for you. While Dr. Ravi is presenting in the first half, we request you to mute yourself and keep your videos off so that we can listen to him in, uh, without any interruption. Of course, you are free to put your comments and questions in the chat and we can take it from there and ask Dr. Bansal. Uh, but uh, when we ask him the questions, uh, we will be uh, asking you to unmute yourself you can also show yourself in the video and ask uh, the question personally. But till the time we ask you to unmute yourself, please remain muted. This webinar is being recorded and it will be on our YouTube channel. We are also live on our YouTube channel as of now. So we welcome you to revisit the content yourself and share it with your friends. Please also be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel to get our updates on a regular basis. Let me now hand it over to Muthu, the president of our Michigan chapter, to introduce Dr. Bansal. Muthu? Yeah. Thank you, Vatsala. Let me share my screen. Let me... Hello, welcome. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Uh, you see my screen. So thank you all for joining uh, from all over the world, uh, from various time zones. You could have been retiring in um, late night um, in, in the Indian time zone, or you could have taken a nice stroll or a run in the beautiful Midwest weather today, or probably sipping your California coffee. But uh, you decided to join us today, so we appreciate that. Um, as Vatsala said, we have an interesting presentation coming up. Um, a warm welcome from the Michigan, as well as the ACI National Chapter. Um, amidst the pandemic, we have had a good successful programs launched by ACI throughout th this year. Uh, just like two months ago, in celebration of Women's History Month, we brought in 
uh, women leaders and they talked about social entrepreneurship. We followed that up with a very interesting, unique AI mini summit or con mini conference or AI summit where we brought in the uh, uh, latest and greatest uh, technologists. And uh, as recently as last week, uh, we had a members only event where we uh, nurtured uh, the uh, young and budding and upcoming IT technologists in how to grow in their career. Needless to say, there's an ongoing program, very successful for the members called Mentorship Connect that is uh, going on very well where mentors and mentees uh, from all, you know, all various strata of uh, engineering and IT fields and science fields who are benefiting from the program. Uh, so thanks for joining us and there's more to come from ASCI. And uh, it's our duty to welcome the fresh members. Some of them are even in the Mentorship Connect program. We are gladly uh, um, uh, we're happy to have them here. And the long wait is almost over. Um, uh, after a year, year and a half, one thing we all can do following the STEM and following the science and engineering disciplines is to educate our families and friends to get vaccinated. A simple message. Of course, we don't want to speak, uh, speak to the, you know, give a speech to the choir, but we, we all know how important is this uh, in this juncture. And uh, uh, without further ado, uh, so let's uh, move on to the So at this point, I'd like to invite our chief guest, Dr. Ravi Banzal. And uh, uh, he does not need too much of introduction. He is no stranger to ASCI. Dr. Bunzel is coming on the video. And um, he was uh, also named as an entrepreneur of year 2000 by ASCI not too long ago. And uh, he has tremendous stories to share with us. Um, I let him speak on various things that he has done. Uh, all of them, you know, flight and various new, uh, interesting uh, information that you hear from him, he did it not just for an adventure sake, but for a purpose, for giving back to the motherland, India, as well as to the engineering community. So without any further ado, I'll let uh, Dr. Bansal to come and give us a speech on various things. And... Um, Towards the end, we'll be open to get lots and lots more questions. Um, feel free to chat on YouTube in case you are watching the program there. Also, in the later part of the program, we also will listen on the Clubhouse social media app. So thank you, Dr. Bansal. Over to you. Right, thank, you hey, thank you, Motu, for giving me this opportunity to talk to you guys. And uh, so I'm going to start. Let me first share my screen here and let me know if you guys can hear me and see my screen. Uh, we can hear you very well, so we'll wait for your screen. You can see your screen. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, can you guys all see my screen and hear me? Yes, we can. Yes, Dr. Bansal, yeah. <laughs> Ravi, I think we lost your video. I'm sorry, your audio. Audio, audio, yeah, you are muted. Mute. Yeah, you're just mute. Yeah. Okay. okay. Can you hear me now? Yes. yes, you're back. Okay. So I'm going to start with a quote from Steve Jobs. And he's the one who said, you can't connect the dots looking forward. You can only connect them looking backwards. Everybody has events in their lives. I call them milestone events. Some of them are planned. 
And some of them just happen in spite of you trying to not let them happen. I call them milestone events and Stephen Jobs called them dots. So I'm just going to through, I'm going to go through the dots of my life. And it's 50 years of things I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about from the start of my engineering career. I was actually born in Himachal. And in Himachal, for, for those who know India, Himachal was somewhat of a backward area. They never, at that time when I was growing up, they did not even have an engineering school. So because they did not have an engineering school there, they had reserve seats in all the regional engineering colleges. And I joined, let's see, why is it not moving? Just click on it. I did. Or scroll. Okay. So I joined Regional Engineering College in Allahabad, which is nowadays called NIT. I joined that school in 1967. I was definitely not among the top of the students. I was not on the bottom either. I spent most of my time playing tennis, working out, and a little bit studies. And somehow I managed to graduate with first class. And I was able to get admitted to Arizona State. But there was no financial assistance offered to me. I was really fortunate to be able to get a loan from Bank of India. And I left United, uh, for United States in January of 72 to go to Arizona State. And there I joined nuclear engineering program for my master's. It was part of mechanical engineering. And my plan was that like everybody else that I'll do my master's in a year, which is all the money I had and then look for a job like everybody else at that time, you know, and see if I can somehow get my H1 visa or change it into green card at some point in time. I struggled with my classes there as well, like everywhere else, but I finished my coursework. After I finished my coursework, my professor suggested uh, for my master's project, a project, theoretical project in solar energy. It was a concentrator, which he was thinking of, and he wanted somebody to do mathematical modeling. Mathema mathematical modeling scared the shit out of me. I didn't really want to do it, but I had no choice. I said, okay, I'll do it. I did that project and I finished my master's. After I finished my master's, I wasn't able to get a job. I didn't get a job, so I stuck around in school doing odd jobs here and there, and I tried to stay as full-time student there. And I finished another sem semester. When I was doing the second semester, taking some courses just to waste time, my old professor called me one day and he said, Ravi, you remember the project you did? And uh, one of the professors from Georgia Tech got a research grant from NSF to further develop that. And he wanted to know if you would like to go to Georgia Tech and do a PhD under him. I had never given thought to do PhD, but that's the only choice I had. But I had two problems. One problem was I had not applied to Georgia Tech. And the second one was even if I had applied, there was no way I could get into this, such a highly ranked school. So I told my professor I have not applied there and I'm not gonna be able to get in there. He said, don't worry about it. Just take this number, call Dr. Williams. I called him and he says, can you get here in two weeks? I said, sure, I packed up my bags and left for Georgia Tech and he got me a research assistantship. So here I come, I go to Georgia Tech and for those who know Georgia Tech is known as Yellow Jackets. And Dr. Williams had another couple of students working for him. And the way it was over there that two students were, together were given a cubicle in the lab and I happened to get a cubicle with another student of his, his name was Tom Harton. After I got to know him, he told me, you know, he is a pilot and he belongs to this Yellow Jack Flying Club. Most of the time, these flying club, most schools don't have these. Georgia Tech had that and these flying clubs are mostly on the airports. Students really don't even know about them. But because of Tom Hartman, I learned about it. He took me flying one day 
And sure, I loved it. And I forgot about my studies and I thought I gotta get my pilot license. And I got busy trying to learn flying and didn't do too well in school, but somehow I managed to get both. I managed to get my pilot license as well as I managed to almost finish my PhD. And at that time, Lindy, uh, which was uh, part of Union Carbide, they came to recruit students at Georgia Tech and they recruited me. And I got a letter of recruitment from a place called Tonawanda. And first of all, there were no iPhones. There were no, you know, we didn't know Tonawanda sounded like some place out of moon or something. None of my friends had ever heard of it. We went to the library, looked up in the Atlas, found out it's near a place called Buffalo. So where is Buffalo? Nobody knew. We found out, well, Buffalo is a very cold place and it has Niagara Falls. I'm from Himachal and I knew cold places. You have snow in the mountains and you have waterfalls in the mountains. So I assume must be, must be mountains. And my friends are telling me, oh, you don't wanna go to Buffalo. You're gonna go die of cold over there. And I said, no, you know, this is the only thing I got. And they asked me, when can you come? I said, well, this is December, a few weeks of my thesis to finish. I'll finish it in January. And they said, okay, that sounds good. Why don't you join us? You come here on January 30th and join the company on February 1st. I said, okay. So I packed up my bags and I left for Buffalo. And January 30, 1977, I land in Buffalo. So people who are from Buffalo, they would know this. January 30th, 77 was in the middle of the blizzard of 77, which is absolutely the worst weather day ever experienced by any of the cities in United States, even until today. So I landed in Buffalo and you can see these cars are, you know, those snows, you see these houses, these are the roofs of the houses. The houses were buried in snow. Nobody could get out. I could not even in the wildest of my dreams could imagine someplace so cold and someplace with so much snow. I had not even a jacket. When I actually went to Arizona, it was the hottest place and I was wearing woolen clothes with a tie and everything. And I didn't know that was a warm place. So this place I come and I have no warm clothes and this is the coldest place. Anyway, I joined Buffalo uh, Praxair, which is now Praxair on January 30th, 1977. And I worked there. I started out as a staff engineer and I worked very hard. A couple of years later, I got promoted to be a senior engineer. But then like always, you know, I like to have fun. I bought a motorbike and didn't pay much attention to work and my manager didn't get along with my manager. And he politely asked me if I would find another job. That was 1980. So I was out of a job. My wife was still working, uh, doing residency. She was just about to finish. She had a few months left or a year left and I thought I can't leave Buffalo. All my jobs with PhD were out of Buffalo. And I found a job with a very, very small company called Surbox. And people, it's difficult to read, but it actually was for absorption oxygen. And this was a very, very small division of a very large company out of Cincinnati called Omnicare. And I joined that company thinking, okay, what the hell, even if it is a small company, I'll work there for six months or a year, and then my wife will finish and we'll move, both move out of Buffalo. But I had never worked for a small company and working there was just unbelievable. You know, you could do whatever you wanted to do. You got exposed to everything and I started liking it. And I really loved it. And I, you know, worked very hard. The company started to do well. And one day in 1986, this is after six years, you know, in five, six years, I became the president of that company. Being a president was not a big deal because it was a pretty small company. And in 1986, one uh, person, a young guy from the corporate head office in Cincinnati came to visit us. And he really loved what 
we were doing. And he asked me if you would join my division. I said, sure. And this guy was a young guy. He had an MBA from Wharton School of Business, which at that time was the number one ranked school in the world. And he was extremely hardworking. We got along well. And the company started to do well. And suddenly the corporate decided, okay, this company is going to really do well. And why not we have a person with business background run the business and me as being an engineer, I do the engineering. And they proposed that to me and I didn't like it. I was the president of the company. This guy was working for me and suddenly now he's going to be the president and I'm going to be the in charge of engineering. Didn't seem right. I fought back and they fired me. So I got fired. This was December of 1986. I went home and I was contemplating what am I going to do next? Next day, I got a call. This, this person, his name was Joe Priest. He called me and he said, Ravi, you know, I don't really like what is going on. This is really not fair. fair. And I said, Joe, why do you care? It is fair or not. You're the president of the company now. Have fun. And he said, no, I don't really like it. I said, okay, if you don't like it, how about if you and me start a business? And he said, sure, that sounds very good to me. And I wasn't sure he was serious about it or not serious. But next day he resigned and two of us and another friend of ours, we started the business. And I'll talk about that business. It was still, we were thinking about what to do. And the business we started was similar thing as Orpheum Oxygen. Uh, we were going to, and we called it AirSep. The reason we called it AirSep is because it is air separation. That's the process we were using. And what we were trying, what we were going to do was we were going to eliminate the logistics of delivery of oxygen in cylinders or in liquid form for smaller users, which was a different paradigm uh, for, for us uh, for at that time. So in 1980, so that was December of 86 when we talked about it. In January of 87, we started this company called AirSep for manufacturing medical and industrial air separation equipment business. Our core technology was pressure swing adsorption. And this is AirSep. And we were going to make products for industrial applications, hospital, and, and for respiratory. So the, the equipment we made, our motto was make your own oxygen. Instead of buying oxygen, you make your own oxygen. And we made these small plants uh, for smaller users. And we also made large plants for large, you know, things like mini steel mills, wastewater treatment plants and things like that. But the idea of making your own oxygen sounded very good, but people did not really accept it very well. It's particularly in the United States, there were no logistical issues. There were plenty of oxygen around. Road system were very good. We couldn't sell anything. Even outside of United States, people told me, well, they don't really want to make oxygen. They don't make their own electricity. They don't make their own natural gas. They don't make their medical gases. You know, they run hospitals or they run steel mills. They don't make oxygen. So it was a difficult business. Me and Joe, we, uh, we were successful only in very remote areas of the world. So me and Joe, we traveled 20, 30 countries every year to the remotest parts of the world. And we turned it into a reasonably decent business. In time, we also made these small concentrators for uh, respiratory therapy at home. And, you know, uh, and our businesses start, business started to grow. We did fairly good. It was a very, very niche market at that time. The total market in the world for all of this combined was in 400 to $500 million range. Uh, we did, we were doing pretty good. I made some money and you know, it was year 2005. This is like 17, 18 years uh, later. And I started thinking, oh God, you know, I know how to fly and I haven't flown and I used to love to fly and this and that. And one day I decided to fly to an aircraft manufacturing um, company to look at some planes. I thought maybe I'll buy one. And I went to this company which was making boutique 
sports planes. Uh, it was in Bend, Oregon. And they showed me this plane. I was in love. I, I had never seen anything like this. The only problem was it was way more expensive than what I had in mind. And also it was a high performance plane, way more. I did not have you know, that much flying experience. I hadn't flown in 30 some years. And I had no endorsements on my pilot license to be able to fly this high performance plane. But in any case, you know, when you love something, it's like the ladies. You know, I said, I gotta have this thing. I put deposit and I flew back to Buffalo. And I talked to my instructor. I said, you know, I'm buying this plane. I don't know how to fly. Can you come with me? We'll go back to Ben and fly this plane back to Buffalo. That was about almost 3000 miles flight. So he flew back with me there and both of us, actually not both of us, he flew the plane and we brought it back to Buffalo and I parked it at Buffalo airport. But I was really busy in my business, didn't get to fly it much and got back into my business, but the plane was mine and was in the hangar. Then comes 2012, which is seven years later. Uh, our company had grown quite a bit. We had 700 some employees. We were the world's largest producer of, again, as I said, this was a very niche market, but we were the largest producers of PSA equipment. And we got an offer to sell ASAP to a, a public company called Chart Industries. They were making cryogenic vessels. And the offer, we were not really looking to sell our business, but the offer was good enough that we couldn't refuse. We had already been in business for 27 years. You know, traveling six months a year, going to 20, 30 countries every year was kind of wearing us out, me and Joe both. So we sold our business. After I sold the business, I'm thinking, okay, I had a three years consulting agreement with, with Chart for the transition period. But after a year, I didn't like to be a consultant. You know, when you are owning the business, running the business, giving advice and nobody taking that advice didn't go good with me. And I said, I'm done with consulting. So 2013, I completely retired. And now I thought about my plane, which was sitting in the hangar. I said, oh, wow, I have a plane. I'm going to learn how to fly this a you know, little bit. Took some lessons and I started talking to my wife and my kids. I'm going to fly this plane around the world. And they thought I've gone crazy. I really not a good pilot. I don't really know how to fly it well. The kids are small and this and that. And they were, they didn't want me to do it. And actually I talked a lot, but I myself was quite a bit scared to do it. But I love to talk about, I'm going to take this plane. I'm going to fly this around the world. Kept talking about it for three, four years. And I went to India to visit my brother. And he told me, hey, if you're going to do this, if you're going to take this kind of risk, why don't you do it for some charitable cause? And my sister-in-law had passed with cancer. That sounded good to me. And I said, okay, sounds good. And it came 2017 and I decided to take this plane, go around the world. And I'm gonna spare you guys with the details of preparation and all that, just to give you a few things about flying around the world. The first thing you have to do is you have to plan a route. How are you going to the plane cannot cross the oceans? So you have to plan it out based on the range of the airplane. My plane could fly a thousand miles nonstop. Also, you're only allowed to land at international airports which have immigration, quarantine and custom facilities. These planes also use special fuel, which is not jet fuel. Not every airport has that. So you have to worry about only those. You want to go to only airports where you can get fuel. And then also there is overflight airspace permits involved. You know, I didn't want to fly over Pakistan. North Korea wouldn't let me fly over that. So there are certain issues. Based on these requirements or conditions, you plan a route. In my case, and you know, several people have done these. These routes are pretty much routine, but you know, with few changes. So can you guys see my pointer here? Hello? Yeah, um, Okay. see your map. Okay, so you can see my map and you can see my pointer. Yeah, yeah. This is, yeah. this is yeah. bu Buffalo right here. So I could not really fly across the ocean. So I had to go up north. 
And I went to north of Canada, then cross into Greenland, then Iceland and all that. This red line is the route I planned. This matched all of my conditions, which I mentioned before. And then this is my hometown in Ambala. I was, that was my destination. I wanted to go and then, you know, then go around the world. And as you can see, most of it is flying over water as earth is 70% water. And I'm not gonna bore you with the details, but the most interesting and adventurous part of this whole journey is flying over North Atlantic. If you see my pointer here, this is where the North Atlantic flight takes place from Canada to Greenland. And this is in Arctic Circle. And the reason why it is dangerous to fly there, it is extremely cold. The weather is extremely unpredictable. The winds can change any time. Uh, and then also there are, nobody lives in Greenland, very few people, there are not too many airports. So if you fly there and for some reason you cannot land at a particular airport where you were going, the next airport could be two, 300 miles away. So there are dangerous things involved in this flight. And I'm gonna show you a video of my flight there. So there, here, you know, I'm, because I'm going to fly over the ocean, it is cold water, you have to put on a, what is called a survival suit, which if you happen to have to land or ditch your plane in water, which is icy waters, this suit can keep you floating and alive for up to four or five hours. Hopefully somebody can find you in those four or five hours, or you also carry a life raft. You climb the life raft and then maybe you can live for weeks or months until you're found. So I got, all these things put on and you know the suit itself weighs 30 pounds. It is extremely insulated uh, and you zip it all up and I flew. And first thing you see is all ice. You're flying over ice, you fly over these glaciers. Can you see my pointer and these glaciers? And actually. Yes, we can. Okay, now I don't know what happened. Okay, so when you, you fly over the glaciers and then you cross the land and these glaciers, they calve into what is icebergs. And it is the, just about the most beautiful part of the earth you will fly over. So I'm flying over this and having fun. As soon as I get over the ocean, within like 10, 15 minutes later, I get on my screen a message, GPS signal not available fly dead reckoning. I forgot what dead reckoning meant. I probably had learned about it 30 years ago. I didn't even know what that is. And suddenly without GPS, I lost where I am. And I was extremely scared. I thought, oh my God, this is my first flight over the ocean. The GPS is not working. I may have to ditch in the water. So I'm looking down and ditching the water was not even an option. If you see these white dots, these are all icebergs. So there were literally millions of icebergs in the ocean down there. And I'm thinking, wow, there is not even 10 feet of space in between where I can ditch. While I was contemplating all that, my GPS signal came back. I actually saw the watch, the signal was gone less than two minutes. And I thought 10 years had passed. <laughs> I was kind of nervous, but the fact that GPS came back I was happy and I kept going. Half an hour later or 20 minutes later, my GPS signal, same thing happened to me again. This time I wasn't super nervous. I thought maybe it'll come back and it did. Half an hour later, it happened again. It happened to me two, three times and now I'm nervous. I'm not really sure whether my GPS is really working or what's going on. So I'm praying to God, oh, I hope I, the land, I'm still like an hour away from the land. Finally, the land is coming, and I want to show you a video of the land coming. So I see this land coming, and now my GPS is telling me I'm only five, four miles from the airport, and I'm looking for the biggest airport in Greenland, in a city called Brook, which is the capital city of Greenland. And my GPS signal is telling me I'm two miles from the airport. I don't see the city and I don't see the airport. And I'm getting more and more nervous. My GPS is now telling me I'm almost at the airport. It's 
guys see an airport here? I'm looking, not really. looking very hard and I thought, oh my god, I'm not going to ever find anything. Anyway, so I, as a pilot, is supposed to track off the submarine instrument. So you see this runway coming. Finally, I see this airport. This is the biggest international airport. It's the biggest city. There was 24 hours of daylight. You hear about it, you think about it, but it is really a freaky feeling when you see the sun never sets. And I had my passport ready. I had all my papers ready. Nobody was there to check my passport. Nobody was there to check my paper. It did not matter. They were so welcoming people. I had great time in, in Greenland. So just to talk about the highlights of my trip, the biggest, you know, of course, my highlight was getting to my hometown. Ambala does not have an airport. It has an Air Force base because it's very close to the Pakistan border. My wife had flown down there. She met me there. And because this Air Force base is extremely secure, very close to the border, nobody, no civilian plane had ever been allowed to land there, except for the government officials and all that. I got, I was given special permission because I was from Ambala. I was doing the flight for charity. Not only I was given special permission to land there, the commander of the Air Force Base, Dr. Uh, commander Chavla, he personally greeted me there. All these people, they were extremely nice to me. They took care of my plane and I parked it for their seven days. And I gave a lot of talks at different rotary clubs and all that there. So that was the highlight. So what I was able to accomplish by flying around the world, I became the first person of Indian origin to do that. I was able to, I made a lot of stops in different places, every place. I had press conferences and all that, talked about cancer awareness and the importance of early detection. I promoted the hospital I was raising funds for. And ultimately we raised enough funds and somebody donated the rest of it that we were able to donate uh, MRI machine to the hospital. Just to put things in perspective, you know, flights around the world are pretty challenging. You know, they are compared with climbing Mount Everest because both required a lot of courage and a lot of skills. But as you, by the time I finished it, more than 4,000 people had climbed Mount Everest. More than 500 had gone into space, but only 123 people since the time of Lindbergh and Amelia Earhart had traveled around the world in a plane solo, and I was one of them. And I, so I did that and this was, you know, I came back to India in 2018, gave lots of talks to different, even at a couple of IITs. And I wrote a book, I wrote a book called Clear Direct Destination. This is a pilot talk. The ATC tells you, you are cleared for your destination airport. That's the last command you get before you land. And the book is a little bit of my life story and my flight, how to prepare a flight. But the cover, I wanna explain a little bit. This is me as a kid living in Himachal in the hills flying paper planes and dreaming of flying around the world someday. Our future was not very predictable. We had cloudy future. But as the time goes by, the clouds disappear and then the sun starts shining and your dreams come reality. My paper plane became my plane and I'm, this is flying around the world. My daughter-in-law had designed this cover. And this book is available for download for free. 
uh, on my website, anybody who is interested in reading it. So I was almost 70 years old and my careers, I had created all the dots I was going to ever create and I retired. So now come the kicker and the kicker is all these random dots which I had created, how do they connect? And if they connect. So that's the thing which I wanna talk about. A year later, it is, I've been retired completely not doing anything and comes 2020 and COVID hits. First thing, you know, now it's not COVID in India or anything, it is just COVID everywhere. And the first thing which I learned was Zoom. I had no idea what Zoom is. Nobody ever heard of Zoom and there are Zoom meetings. I had not given a talk to Rotary Clubs in two years or almost a year and a half. And suddenly somebody called me, would you like to be a speaker? It is a Zoom meeting. I said, where are you located? They told me they are in Canada. I gave a talk. Next week, I got a call from Moscow. Somebody had told them, Rotary Club, you know, that I give a good talk and they invited me. Then I got a talk from Texas and suddenly every other week, I get invited to give a talk about my flight around the world. And I'm thinking, yes, you know, that was a years ago, but I started enjoying it. And I thought, okay, now it is done. I'm done talking about flying and talking about all these things and six months of doing nothing. And then what happens comes 2021. And there is a COVID second wave of COVID in India and everybody reading, there is no oxygen. In India, nobody had ever heard the TV, you turn TV on and everybody talking about oxygen and all that. And then what happens? Airsep, which was still the largest company in the world providing PSA oxygen. They, now I'm not involved with Airsep for last eight, 10 years. I'm just talking about it, what I read and what, you know, I know some people there. And Airsep became the largest supplier of PSA oxygen plants to India and also the concentrators. And I feel so great. There are, you know, papers were, you know, had news about let this be the last oxygen crisis in India and AirCEP is being promoted as the final solution for all these things. And that made me feel really, really good. Um, and then I get invited, some health officials find out that I was the one who founded AirCEP. I have no idea how somebody found me. And then I got all these Zoom meetings with the health, government health officials from India from different states. Maharashtra, Karnataka, Kannada, and you know, I'm talking about what they should be looking for in the equipment. And just you know, at the time, 35 years ago, when I was founding AirSAP, we were just doing it as a purely business venture, had absolutely no idea it would amount to anything. And especially to just learn that it turned out to be the most incredible humanitarian endeavor in the darkest of the times for my country, it just makes me feel great. Anyway, that's all I wanted to talk about. That's how, that's how the dots connect. You don't ever think about it. I had not ever given a thought there would be something called pandemic. There would be something anybody would ever know of AirSAP. That was the last thing on my mind. All we were trying to do was trying to survive, make some money for ourselves so we can take care of our families. So that's how things in life happen and we create dots. So that's all I have to say if you have any questions. I hope I didn't take too much of your time. No, no, uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bansal. Uh, it was uh, inspiring as one of the participants just chatted here all the way from Ambala to America. Your history and uh, your life journey really talks a lot and very inspirational to all of us. So uh, um, this is great. Uh, uh, if you can stop sharing your screen so we can just get on to uh, common chatting. Thank you, thanks, thank you again. It was all inspiring speech. When, when I heard it the very first time, it was uh, really inspirational. So I have a couple of questions. Um, I'd like to start off. Then later, we'll open it for the audience to come and uh, ask their own questions. 
so so number one uh, you know the pure engineer in me and and the tech the technical side of me wanted to ask you that uh, when you started airsep was that um a a competitive venture to linde uh, because we know linde came back to prominence now right from oxygens and hydrogen and all these liquefied gases business so how is that uh, was that a competitive idea that you got actually this technology originally lot of the work was developed in thonawanda at lindi all the zeolites were developed there all the psa technology was developed there so they had you know it was in infancy but they did not want to take it out and market it because it was going to compete with their own business which was selling gases you rather we selling something consumable than to sell a capital equipment because you capital equipment you would sell only once and then nobody would need you so they did not really want to promote it it is us who promoted it and initially they actually you know they were the ones who told everybody hey you guys buy these plants you don't really know how to operate it this is a critical gas and if the plant shuts down for one day and you'll lose the production and whatever money you save will be gone in one day so we had difficult time that's why we traveled the world we were only able to sell these things into very remote areas but ultimately they became our biggest customers as well once we started making these smaller uh, concentrators for home use they had home care businesses and actually i was the biggest supplier of uh, concentrators to air liquide and to lindi for long time because they had these home care businesses themselves which were pretty lucrative but medical oxygen is always sold at 10 times the price even though there is nothing medical oxygen or industrial oxygen it is the same oxygen is the same only difference is you add a bacteria filter not only that you talk about oh we'll give you the quality assurance certificates and all that but the oxygen is the same it is such a i shouldn't say you know just by saying those things they can charge 10 times the price for medical oxygen and medical oxygen the total amount of usage on medical is only 5 to 7% of the total production but that 5 to 7% brings 20% of the revenues to them and industrial gas business is the extremely monopolized business in the world there are only 3 4 companies who own hundreds of billions of dollar business yeah. it's only air liquid or it is lindi now and and air products and then there is nobody else everybody else is their subsidiaries people don't realize this this is the most most monopolized business in the world hmm. and it needs to be antitrust sometime need to be broken but they talk about it it has never been done great yeah thank you and as you said how did it feel that the whole thing came around one circle and uh, how does it feel to give back to your motherland <laughs> you know i just feel great actually i have not had much to do with their stuff in long time only give back from my side right these days is you know when they call me for advice i can tell them what type of equipment what it takes to monitor how to maintain it that is my input at this point in time i don't own the business but i just feel proud that it is something which i started you know i still have lots of friends there uh, the company it, it was a tough business i sold it to chart they could not got get it going they ultimately ended up selling to japanese uh, which is ngk so now it is owned by japanese nobody had predicted pandemic right now it is the business to be in my company airsep is worth over billion dollar i didn't get a billion dollars if i owned it for this long i would be a billionaire too but again nobody predicts these things this was a very very tough business capital equipment business trying to sell it in remote parts of the world is not so easy i traveled literally the jungles of every place i left my blood sweat and tears every place i went that's the legacy it you it was leave. 35 years huh yeah that's the legacy my you friend, <laughs> my friend phil thomas i see hi phil hi 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 ravi wonderful to see you looking so well you've always been a humanitarian <laughs> come on phil this is my friend phil thomas he developed all the business in india he's a kiwi 
<laughs> and he traveled uh, with uh, me. Uh, at 10 to 6 in the morning here, Ravi. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, nice to see you, Phil. I didn't know you were joining. Yeah. But anything in India, he traveled to India so many times. And Phil, you can maybe add how difficult it was to get this business going in India. Now they are dying to get this. Thing. Well, let, let, let's go back to 1987, you know, 1988, actually, when I joined you. Um, and we, we, we tried to get the business going in New Zealand and Australia at that time. And uh, we were able to um, find a company uh, that wanted to, needed a lot of oxygen for a pulp and paper mill. Well, that was New Zealand, yes. And, and that was in your slide earlier. And, and that was an interesting story because in New Zealand, as you say, the, the, the big bulk uh, businesses, the, oxygen, the gas businesses, they, they are the ones that control the market. So we had to keep it really low key and we were able to get that contract. And that represented 20% of the New Zealand oxygen market. And it really put us on the map, didn't it? Oh, it did. You know, they, Phil, you don't remember or maybe know, they had asked me to come at look at that plant after 30 years. And I did some consulting and, you know, that plant is still working 35 years later. And it's still working today, gave, 40 years later. <laughs> and then... I and just then have to just, tell... Phil, I just have to tell you. Phil, I just have to tell you, I charged them $40,000 for two days of consulting. <laughs> well done. Well done. Uh, you are also a humanitarian. <laughs> Great. Anyway. So, so, Dr. Ravi, well, based on whatever happened has happened in India, you know, we all lost a lot of uh, someone we know. We, we lost loved ones, loved ones and friends and family in most of the cases. What message would you like to give for the, uh, you know, the, the healthcare industry, hospitals that went through this crisis so that in the future, we'll never have to go through such an oxygen crisis? You know, people say oxygen is everywhere. Still not enough to breathe. You know, when something like this happens, people go into a frenzy mode. But ultimately, you know, now... With India, you know, it is PSA, Prime Minister's Care thing has ordered 1,600 some plants and all that. But it's not going to be only PSA. They have, it is going to be a combination of PSA, liquid oxygen and compressed, you know, every one of these things have some imperfections. Even PSA has imperfections in the sense it's got valves which are operating every 20, 30 seconds. The air is quite polluted in India. The filters get plugged, you know, drain valves get plugged, uh, hospitals, don't have very good engineers to maintain these kind of things. They probably will learn ultimately. These are not extremely difficult things to, to maintain, but if it is not monitored almost every other day or something, it can have problems. So I, I think, you know, I was talking, it just so happened that the person who is the science and tech the secretary for the government of India, the number one uh, person in charge, Ashutosh Sharma, he's a friend of mine. I was talking to him. And he, he told me as well that, you know, it was everybody got into frenzy, but everything is now under control. If there is going to be a third wave or anything, it's not going to be that much. You will not hear that much people running around, you know, like chickens. Everything is controlled. Everybody has learned. I think, you know, it's not going to happen again. I, I just don't think it will happen again, ever again. But what you will hear is, you know, so many plants have been sold to everybody, every hospital in all sorts of remote areas and all that. They may have some issues, plants breaking down and nobody maintaining and people finger pointing to each other that you will read in the papers, but ultimately they'll learn as well. You know, it, they, they are doctors, they run hospitals, they don't make, they don't run mechanical equipment. A PSA plant is relatively simple, but it still has a compressor which runs all the time. You have a refrigerated dryer. You have, you know, valves which are operating every 20, 30 seconds. You're pressurizing, depression. You know, there is, there are things which are happening in the process. That's right. 
So, you know, there would be a learning process. We had to educate everybody all the time. Just keep educating, educating, telling them all about how to maintain the product. You know, I mean, it's just an ongoing issue. Yeah. Sure. So, uh, Ephil, like to... where are you right now? Yeah. Uh, I'm in uh, Waiheke Island in New Zealand. Oh, okay, I thought you were in Thailand. Okay. No. So, Kumar, uh, open to you. Uh, you, you can go ahead with your question. Oh, uh, first of all, thank you, ASCI, for bringing this. Uh, Ravi, uh, it was a wonderful speech, and you actually took us and landed us in Greenland, which was fantastic. I've never had that experience. Um, the, the, two things. Uh, I was going back when you gave your life journey and how you got onto that, um, the, the way you shifted to become a business entrepreneur. I hope a lot of children are listening is that one of the nervous things we all go through is that, is my product going to sell? What is a product which has got a lot of market? But you hit on an oxygen concentrator or something, which at that point looks like you had to scour the world to sell that. But how did you decide that is the product I'm going to do as an entrepreneur when you started in that stage of life, that was one question. Uh, and then there are a lot of other questions, but that will be an interesting lesson for us to learn. A lot of us are budding entrepreneurs. We always think you want to be an entrepreneur. You know, this is something which, you know, at Lindy, I had done a little bit. Zorbox was doing that. Mm -hmm. uh, that was the only thing I knew. Actually, you know, anytime you want to start a business, people will tell you, you have to be at the right place, right time <laughs> in the right industry. Yeah. Okay, so I can tell you something that right place, right time, right industry. If you have a game changer idea, every place is right place and your garage is the best place and right time and right industry, You, if you know how to make an iPhone. So that is one thing, but I did not have a game changer idea. Right. So the other way to make every place right time, right industry, right, is you change a paradigm or you improve a product, you improve a pro process or you improve a service. And you need to go into an industry which is extremely big. And if you improve even by 5 7% something and you are able to get 1% of that existing market, that's much easier to do than to come up with a game-changing idea, create Google or you create iPhone or something. What happens these days, everybody is running after trying to come up with these game-changing ideas. And you know they hear about five companies you know, Google or iPhone, but you know, they are five companies in the last hundred years. Right. There are hundred million companies which have succeeded, which did not have a game changer idea. All they did was they improve a product, a service, or a manufacturer, you know, slightly. And that is the easiest way to bring, you know, you know, uh, odds to your side. In my mind, you have much better chance of success if you were to go that route. Very few people are able to come up with game-changing idea, but those are the ones we hear about. We only hear about Elon Musk. We only hear about few people. We're not going to, you know, I hope everybody in India becomes that, but that's not going to happen. Exactly. That, that message has to come because in, in today's innovation world, everybody thinks of going after only these new earth shattering ideas, but the message, what you said has to be heard and people have missing a lot of opportunities. That, that was the message. And so my only request to you, uh, Dr. Ravi, is that our students should hear. So I know you're giving, giving a lot of talks. A lot of uh, students would be a fantastic audience if you're already not talking to them because how to connect the dots and always looking for that end to end idea is not always the case. You have to jump in and go with the flow like you did every step of the life journey you took. It was a wonderful message. Thank you so much. Appreciate your yeah. message. Yeah. Thank, thank you, Kumar. Um, there's, there's one other question from Lovina, who's one of our past uh, panelists from the uh, March event. Lovina, if you want to unmute yourself and switch on your video and go ahead with your question. Of course. Hello, Dr. Bansal. Uh, it was such a pleasure to be listening to your life journey, I have to say, and I'm a fellow um, MNNITN um, uh, uh, from Muthu's batch. Uh, so it's, it's, it's a great pleasure. Um, uh, well, one thing, you started off your talk with, uh, just one second, sorry. You started off your talk with um, uh, the dots, um, you know, from, uh, 
uh, when you look back. And one thing that I could tell just by listening to your story here is uh, uh, that you're definitely not afraid to take risks, be it your professional career or you know make, taking that decision to take the solo flight. And um, uh, is also my immense pleasure actually on this call. This is the first professional uh, kind of session. I guess that I'm sharing with my son as well, who's studying aerospace engineering. Um, so he's on the call too. Um, uh, but, uh, and, and also I appreciate the, appreciate the fact that you didn't just focus on the highlights or the positives. You also shared with us the lowlights, um, you know, getting fired twice. And it's a very important lesson, especially for the young ones who are on the call, I find it's, uh, Sometimes when you're going through a low phase and it's temporary, right? Uh, so what would be my question to you is to, um, uh, for, for, for these young engineers who are in the making or who have just barely perhaps uh, started their uh, career, what would be uh, the one thing that you would advise them to not let go of while they are um, starting off commencing their journey? I can say anytime an opportunity comes, that never comes as an opportunity. It comes to you as the biggest problem you ever had. The question is, can you recognize or can you just take that on and hopefully it turns into something else? You know, it is, I would have never started a business that was not in my genes I never thought about it. I wasn't dying to do anything. It is I never could keep a job. I got fired from the car wash I worked at. I got fired from Lindy. I got, you know, it is just, I just could not. And then even though I had was consultant to chart, I just, I had to do my own things. But it never came as an opportunity. It came as a problem. And then, you know, one thing you have to be able to do is, work hard. I mean, you know, I can make jokes and talk lightly. You know, I worked hard. It takes hard work to succeed at anything. Mm -hmm. You know, ultimately you have to work hard. And, and, and perhaps, it's only and thing perhaps is failures. And, hmm? and perhaps a, 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 an immense belief in yourself too, I guess, at some, at some level. Absolutely. You have to have belief in yourself and, and you know, you have to you have to use any and all the resources which you might have at your disposal. Sometimes you don't know what resources you have in your friends, in your family, in, in anybody. You know, this is the, again, you know, I was talking about here, I got fired from a job and the person who was given the job of a president, he called me and he didn't like it. And he was not my best friend or anything. He had worked for me only five, six months. And he himself is the most incredibly hardworking and intelligent person I have ever met. He's like my brother now. Mm. We've been together for 40. <laughs> okay, a little joke. So first, when we first started, his name is Joe Priest. And my name is Ravi. So we were working 24 hours a day in a small room. And sometimes calls would come and call came. And he, uh, the person on the other end calls me and he says, can I speak to the priest, please? I said, Mr. Priest, Mr. Priest is not here. Can I help you? He said, oh, the priest is not there. Can I speak to the rabbi? And I said, this is him. And the guy, he said, am I speaking to the rabbi? Because a lot of people call me rabbi. I was very serious. And the guy asked me three times, am I speaking to the rabbi? I said, this is him. And the guy just started laughing. He couldn't hold on to the phone. You know, because I thought, he said, the priest is not there. He'd speak to the rabbi. And I thought, and he was a Jewish guy. His name was, I forget, it, Mr. something. He was my customer for the next 20 years. Mm -hmm. One of my best customers ever. So I guess it's, it's so, good you know, to have a good sense of humor too. <laughs> No, I didn't have a good sense of humor. I thought he was, he, I just thought he was talking to the rabbi, rabbi, rabbi or whatever, anybody who wants to talk to me, I'll sit, yes. But you know, things, um, the, the point I was making was, 
you don't know what your resources you may have. I did not ever realize or know that Joe is my best friend and he would, we hardly knew, he's 10, 12 years younger than me, came from the brightest, best school in the world. And he's the one who called me at home and telling me, oh, I don't like it, this is not fair. And in that company, I was the only Indian. Everybody else was American. Anyway, so, you know, you need to get along with everybody. You need to realize what resources you have. Phil Thomas, my buddy, is already joined. You know, I didn't even know he was going to join. But there are others like that. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for uh, sharing that. And by the way, um, our vice president of research for AirSAP, he was given the highest uh, medal of technology from President Obama at, at the White House. So, you know, we had good technology in our company. Okay, um, there's one more question uh, before Ram takes on the stage. Uh, Nikhil Srivastava, do you have a question to ask uh, Dr. Bansal? Hi, Dr. Bansal, I just wanted to thank you uh, for sharing your story. Um, I just wanted to say that I'm a student right now at Carleton University in Ottawa, uh, Canada, where you uh, flew to as well. Uh, you went to Iqaluit, I believe. And uh, I'm currently studying aerospace engineering. And I was able to connect with you kind of on that level because you were able to fly the plane, the Cessna, I believe it was. Um, and, you know, after you uh, shared your story, I'm actually strongly considering um, taking uh, flying lessons. So I'm going to strongly consider doing that as I, I think it's really interesting, and I would like to fly a plane as well. All the best, all the best to you. Anything can be done, it's not that big a deal. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Nikhil. Um, so uh, the, uh, the plays that, uh, uh, kind of odd sounding plays that Dr. Ravi Bansal mentioned, Tonawanda is no strange, <laughs> strange place to Ram, who used to be, our plant manager there who also you know introduced Dr. Ravi Bansal to ACI so I'd, I'd like to have Ram here and come this little speech to so thank you everybody. Great thanks Muthu thanks Ravi always great to see you and again appreciate you take the time to come share uh, with us and for those of you who don't know uh, Ravi is not new to ACI he has been engaged with ACI in the past and in fact he is uh, been helping us get the chapter up and running and engaged back in Buffalo as well. So I'd first like to start by again, thanking Ravi, as most of you would have got by now. He is really a leader in the community in Buffalo, a uh, fellow Tanawandian, but mostly a leader in the community. And uh, some of the things that uh, you mentioned, and it came through, right? We don't have to say it, but it came through. I think Lorena mentioned it as well. You do have a great sense of humor. And that really helps get the message across because in all honesty, it's a very important and serious message, especially for the future as others pointed to. And your sense of humor really helps you know, deliver the message. Um, you, you really share some vulnerability, Ravi. Uh, it's not easy, That's, you have to have courage to do that and your humility comes through as well. So again, really appreciate you for those characteristics because beyond the technicalities of what you shared, uh, we also learned by listening to you how to be a good leader, some of the key characteristics there. And then finally, following your passion, you taught us how to do that. So thanks. Thanks for sharing your story. Thanks for displaying your character that we can learn from and I appreciate you spending time uh, with us today. Uh, also, I think uh, you kind of mentioned Rotary. I think there might be some fellow Rotarians on the call. So I appreciate them joining as well from around the world. Uh, I know you've done a lot for the Rotary Club in Buffalo and across the other areas as well. So thanks for your uh, contributions there as well. So I'd also like to additionally thank Mutu. Great job pulling this together and, uh, and you know, moderating the session. Thanks to Watsala, uh, as usual, for doing a great job with the Zoom. And then on behalf of the Michigan ASCI Board and the National ASCI Board, I'd like to say thank you again, Ravi. And to all the participants from across the world in different time zones for joining us and listening to Ravi and helping us learn and grow. Thank you all very much. Mutu, back to you. I think we have uh, some additional uh, time yeah, yeah. for networking. Thanks. That's right. That's right. Yeah, thank you so much, Ram. Uh, 
sincerely appreciate uh, your reference as well as a great speech by Dr. Bansal. So we have another 15, 20 minutes uh, for networking as well as q and I, I think we have some, some questions from our national president, Piyush, followed by Vatsala. You guys, please start. Thanks, Amutu. Um, Dr. Ravi Bansal, it was a pleasure listening to you. It was uh, definitely an, a memorable experience. I had never heard uh, the engine roaring in a Zoom call before, and uh, your talk uh, combined all of that. So it, it was a very, very uh, inspiring story that you have. And just to reset the room on Clubhouse, we've been live streaming this event on Clubhouse as well, as we did last week. We had great participation there. And this is to enable the voices of inspiring engineers to not only ASCI members, but beyond the knowledge should not be saved. It should be shared wide and large and wide. So with that objective, uh, if those of you who want to join the after party on Clubhouse, please hop on there and we will have an uh, unfiltered, unrecorded session on Clubhouse. And uh, for those who are camera shy and haven't come on camera and asked questions, uh, that would be an opportunity. So with that, um, uh, Dr. Benson, the question for you from me is, uh, you've been involved with ACI in the past, as uh, Ram just mentioned. and. Uh, uh, you've seen what how the organization has grown. What would be your message to professionals out there who are not yet members of ASCI, why they should join a professional organization like American Society of Engineers, Indian origin? In my mind, you know, first of all, networking is always the best resource anybody could ever have. And to be able to network with your... Uh, peers and, you know, we have a lot of common issues, you know, being uh, foreigners, you know, I've been in US for 50 years, I'm an American, but if I tell somebody I'm an American, they don't believe it. They keep asking me, where are you from? You know, I can tell them 10 different answers, but until I tell them, oh yes, well, I'm from India, they're not satisfied. They're never satisfied, you know, it's written on over four. So we might as well accept, you know, that with a lot of pride. And I, I just think networking is a very big thing. And a lot of Indian engineers have done incredibly well. So if you network with ASEI, you get, uh, you know, get to know the people uh, who can be extremely helpful um, in your career or you can do together things. So I, I, I think it's a, one of the best resources somebody could have. So that's all I can say, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a, one of the best resources uh, for, for, for us. Great, thank so you. I would tell everybody to join it. Great, great, thank you, thank you. And I appreciate, appreciate your answer there. So uh, on, on that note, uh, if there are, folks who are not who are not ASCI members, obviously they should join. Um, it's very easy and uh, through our website, ASAIUSA.org. And for those who are members and are not active, I would like them to get active as well. This is an appeal to all of them, all, all the listeners here. So connect with any of the organizers here, Vatsla, Muttu, Ram, myself, and we'd, we'd be happy to engage with you. So with that, I think Vatsla had a question. So Vatsla, go ahead, please. Thank you, Piyush. Ravi, that was uh, obviously an awesome presentation and your journey is very incre incredible. Uh, we, we know that anyway. But my question to you was, uh, you bought the plane and did not use it for like five, six years. We uh, leave our car in the garage for six months and it doesn't work. <laughs> so... <laughs> Okay. What is the okay, go ahead, finish your question. Yeah. What's, what's the difference? No, no, first of all, when I say I did not touch the plane, I have to maintain currency. When I say currency means, you know, when you get a pilot license, it's a license for life. Nobody comes out to check you, whether you are current, whether you are proficient or not. 
only thing they want you to keep your medical license current, which is renewed every two years. Other than that, there is no check for pilot currency because they already they always assume you're not going to go and kill yourself. You yourself, you you like your life more than anybody else will. So there is something called maintaining proficiency and currency. And even though the plane was parked, you know, I did take it out every so often, most of the time with my instructor, because I never really flew it enough to be comfortable to fly it by myself. But for, you know, I will fly every couple of months, you know, I'll take my instructor with me and I take lessons and I'm current again, fly once or twice myself. So I kept current. You know, it's not like, you know, I completely never touched it. And also these planes have to be, like you said, like cars. They must be started and all that every, at least every six weeks, otherwise the batteries die. And also it is just something which is not in use would always have degradation of things. And it is your life. It is not a simple thing. Your car breaks down, you're still on land. You call the tow truck and tow you. But if your train break down, you're not coming back to see your family. <laughs> Just that's not going to happen. Right. And, you right. know, again, it's the other thing. When I was flying around the world over water, the biggest risk thing is that, you know, if the engine fails, you don't glide. Most of the time, if you're on the land, you glide someplace, land on a road, do something, and you can save yourself. When you are in water... First of all, you're not going to survive ditching. Most of the time, it's for the birds. You, know, you don't. Even if you survive in water, you get onto your life raft and all that. You are a speck of sand in hundreds of millions of square miles. Nobody is going to find you. Nobody is. They can be looking around for you for months and all that. So you have to learn how to be found. You carry PLBs. You carry mirrors. You carry flares and all that. You hope somebody... But there is a complete set of training you have to take, how to be found. So there was, you know, I did not talk about all the preparation to before you go around the world, but there is some preparations required. There are lots of logistics. Required. You know, in 20 minutes, I wasn't going to bore everybody with the details of everything. But if somebody would read my book, I have written everything about, you know, what it takes to go flying around the world. So anyway. uh -huh. I, I am quite sure it takes a long, uh, uh, huge preparation because I traveling to India itself takes so much of preparation. So I'm sure. But uh, what an incredible thing to do! Uh, you bought the uh, bought a plane which was uh, not within your means to buy, and the plane actually. No, I didn't say so no, no, no. First of all, I didn't say it wasn't within my means to buy. It was definitely within my means. Otherwise, I couldn't. Yeah, yeah. What I was saying right. was that I right. did not think of spending that kind of money. Right, right. That, that's what I'm saying. You did not think of spending that much money for the plane to buy. But then the plane made you think of something you wouldn't have ever thought in your life to do on the solo journey. So it went both ways. Great. Thank you. Thank you for the awesome presentation and uh, all the inspiration that you bring along. Muthu? Yeah, any other, any other questions from the audience? I have one comment. Sure. Uh, I, uh, uh, Dr. Bansal, I had the pleasure to listen to Dick Ruthen, who also did the first uh, around the world in without landing anywhere. Regina so, Yeager. Yeah. And so I, I was inspired in one way. That was a technical feat. And when I look, heard you speak another RTW as the only Indian, it gives me pride. And for doing that for a humanitarian cause, it's, it takes you to another level. So thanks for uh, uh, doing that for that cause. And then whatever you did was very, very inspirational. It was inspirational at a different level. Thank you so much for sharing your story. Okay, I have to, so I just want to tell you something. Yeah. Dick Rutan, Dick yeah. Rutan bought, bought exactly the same plane which I did. Oh, yeah. And we, <laughs> we went to pick it up at the same time ah. at the factory. And when you pick up the plane at the factory, they give you training for three days. Okay. And me and Dick me and Dick Rutan, we trained in the same plane at the same time for three days. <laughs> That's an interesting coincidence. <laughs> awesome. 
what a story thank you <laughs> thank you for for viewers benefit would you want to explain uh, who this other person is oh dick rutan uh, uh, ravi can do much better than i can yeah, okay well dick rutan uh, i'm trying to remember the his older brother's name and he is the one who designed this space flight for space plane for virgin galactic ah so these rutan brothers they are extremely famous aviate in aviation businesses they are the ones actually the plane was designed by dick's brother but dick and gina yeager flew that plane around the world without refueling and yeah. that is the very very big deal they did not land anywhere they it took them i forgot 3 4 days of continuous flight right right and that was the biggest feat they did but they been involved in designing planes for a long time i'm trying to remember the name of his brother he's the one I, I, who designed I, yeah i, I forget the, the name too he is the one who won won the ansari prize for going in the space uh, at suborbital and richard branson bought the technology from him to this space flight with they just did 2 3 days ago exactly and if i may add to the for the technical audience here right that because he dick had to that, that flight plane wing was like many 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 meters long the longest wing span you could have had and when it was standing with the full load the wings will touch the ground due to the weight only when yes, it could it get get a speed if the wings will come up because of the lift and then with that wing span they he needed all the lift to fly across the world with that one full a uh, lot so for him timing was important and he could not run out of the fuel before he came back and landed where he started so that was a phenomenal story so it was fantastic and they, when they were when they were taking off at the airport with the fuel in them their tips touched the ground and actually ground. they broke the tips but they <laughs> took off anyway yeah saran right uh, here say, i think his brother's name is bert rutan bert rutan yes correct. bert rutan okay yes. right you know i was i kept thinking about it I yeah. never met him but I met Dick Rutan. I hope yes. he remembers me because it was a long time ago. <laughs> right, right. So, so, so I now know two people sir. around the world so I yeah. I can say uh, our uh, memory is very good but Google is there forever so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So on that topic uh, Dr. Banzo um what do you think of the the current you know kind of space uh, flight race that's going on is this going to be like interesting i mean definitely is interesting but what is the future you know between bezos and Dr., you know sir branson what what are your perspective i don't really know what the future or i don't care i would love to go i would be i would want to be the first one to go with them i just i registered with them I, they sent me an email okay when they start selling the tickets they will let me know <laughs> you know it was it is an exciting thing for me to watch that you know there are two two ways now jeff bezos is going as well but that is a rocket it will go up and down in less than 10 minutes it's 11 minutes total time whereas yeah. the other one they had to take it to 50000 feet before they drop the plane and then it's almost hour and a half ride and you you know it, it is just was so exciting for me to watch that you know these things are not going to be like you know the serve any purpose in the sense maybe these are wasteful and somebody say why don't you just donate the money and not pay 250 or 300000 dollars to go up there but these things always always end up in advancement of science advancement of lot of things everything which we use came out of space research space thing and it was such a big waste to go to moon and back but everything we use in our daily life is as a result of whatever research was done for those purposes you know most of the research always comes out of defense or space you know no, nobody should fight <laughs> but <laughs> but the defense is what brings all the research into daily lives and make our lives better so okay. I, i am no one to say what should be done and what should not be done given a chance i want to go to space that's all i can say a <laughs> lot of lot of folks are in the queue now it seems <laughs> <laughs> no, you, you had a very interesting question because i've seen uh, earlier i used to see these folks as competing but now um just uh, you know the day um uh, richard Ban- branson was going on space uh, into space um i saw a picture of, of elon musk with him and uh, uh dr bansal you just said um that uh, uh 
written uh, had won the Ansari SpaceX Prize. So somehow all these things are connected and um, very well said that you know, advancement of science may not be evident right now and these things may appear uh, extravagant and frivolous, but they ultimately contribute to advancement of humanity. Who would have thought a uh, hundred years ago that we would be thinking about uh, going to Mars? Um, you know, if it was not for the aerospace industry, it was not for the very first flight that took off from Kitty Hawk, we wouldn't be thinking about going to space and space tourism. So uh, it's, it's exciting times ahead. There are people like Naveen Jain who are thinking of uh, mining asteroids. And we had Naveen Jain talk to us, all of us, uh, about eight months ago uh, at our last national convention. And uh, uh, we learned a lot how he is uh, part of it. But then last week I saw he also uh, com came, commented on social media that he is in line to go on the Virgin Galactic flight. So <laughs> he, he and his son have bought a ticket and they have not been given a place. So exciting times indeed. I'll just rest my comment there and uh, uh, see if we have any other uh, closing questions from anyone. I think we are, we are good. Uh, are we moving ahead with Clubhouse, uh, Piyush? Yeah, uh, there are some uh, folks uh, who have joined on Clubhouse. So uh, Dr. Bansal, if you can uh, come on Clubhouse, uh, we'll end the recording here so that we can have at least 10, 15 minutes of unfiltered conversation on Clubhouse as well. Anyone who's here, I've posted a link on the chat channel here. We should uh, get in there uh, as, soon, as soon as possible as uh, Muthu will wrap up here. What? All right. Yeah. Walid, did you have nice a question? Nice to see you, Ravi. Nice Thank to you. see you, Phil. Take care. All the best. Yeah, all really? right, mate. Bye bye. We will close the Zoom session uh, so, here. Piyush, I really don't know how to use Clubhouse. And also, I need, I can be there for another 15 minutes beyond that. I have a flight. That should be fine. To Buffalo. Okay, uh, if, if, we, if we don't have time, that's fine. Uh, no, we'll... no, I have time, but I don't know how to get on that. How do I get on it? Can you explain it yes. to me a little bit? If you go to Clubhouse icon there, you should be able to get there easily. Um, on on your... my phone? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And since okay, you I'll are uh, added a speaker there, just do that while you're here so that there's no uh, confusion. And we had people come in and out of the, that room but since it was non-interactive mode, people leave. Clubhouse has a different protocol than uh, what we do on Zoom. So, but for the purposes of the Hello, audience can you, there. Can we stop the recording here? Yeah, please stop the recording. One second. And uh, we'll, we'll just close it out for... Uh, Arimutu, close it for the YouTube audience as well. Yeah.